Good morning, students. So as per request, today I'm going to be creating a light board video which goes through joint classification associated with the major joints that we have learnt of the upper and lower limb as well as the vertebral column. So as you will recall from week one, we went through the structural versus functional classification associated with each joint. So it's important that we just go back over this and we know what is meant when I ask you what is the functional classification or the structural classification of a joint. So when I'm talking about functional classification, usually we're talking about the range of movement associated with the joint. So there are three specific functional classifications that we use, which are obviously going to vary from non-mobile, or the joints don't move at all, to the most mobile joints, which are going to be our synovial joints. So the first type of joint is a synarthrotic joint. So our synarthrotic joints are going to be those that don't enable any movement, such as sutures in the skull, for instance. The second type of the joint then is going to be an amphiarthrotic joint. So our amphiarthrotic joints are going to allow some movement to occur, but not a great deal. Our most common types of joints, so especially those associated with the limbs, are going to be our diarthrotic joints. So these are then going to permit the highest degree of movement possible. And we tend to classify this movement using um, the number of planes that a joint can move in. So we'll just write these are going to be highly mobile. Okay, so then when we're talking about the structural classification with associated with the joint, this is going to be what is the material or the material composition that is actually actually linking bones together. So this is going to be the type of connecting material associated with the joint. So again, there are going to be three different types of joints in terms of their structural classification. So the first one is going to be our fibrous joints. So our fibrous joints are going to be made up of dense connective tissue. And there are two types of specific fibrous joints that we are interested in and that we have learned. So specifically, if we draw this out here, the first kind is called a suture. So I'm sure you would have come across the term suture before. So a suture is going to form, so we find sutures in the skull, and it's essentially made up of a very thin layer of connective tissue that is going to occur between interlocking bones. So our fibrous tissue types or our fibrous structural types, such as a suture, are designed so that they're not going to permit any movement. So this, in fact, is going to be a synarthrotic joint. So if I just draw this in a different colour, so a suture is classified as The second type of fibrous joint then that we get is called a syndesmosis. So as we have learned, a syndesmosis usually is referring to a thicker band of connective tissue or a ligament that is going to help to secure or hold two parallel bones together. So typical places that we'll find a syndesmosis is going to be the interosseous membrane, which we're going to find between the bones of the forearm, such as the ulna and the radius, or the bones of the lower leg, such as the tibia and the fibula. We're also going to find syndesmosis in the joints of the vertebral column, so specifically when we're looking at the joints associated with adjacent neural arches. So our zygote epiphyseal joints, for instance, the ligaments associated with those joints will be syndesmosis, as well as structures such as the ligamentous flavum that we've learnt about. Because these are more associated with joints, 
they do allow a slight degree of movement. So we don't say that they are synarthrotic joints. They are actually amphiarthrotic joints. So as the ligamentum flavum, so as the vertebrae are actually moving, the ligamentum flavum has some capacity to move. Okay, so these are our fibrous joints made up of dense um, connective tissue. The second type of joint then is what is called a cartilaginous joint. So our cartilaginous joints, again, we have two subclassifications associated with these. The first one is what is called a synchondrosis. So a synchondrosis is usually going to be found when we're talking about the growing skeleton. So when we're talking about the growth associated with long bones, or when we're talking about specific joints such as the sternocostal joint, so between the first rib and the sternum, where we have a highline cartilage interface. So the way we can break this up is in terms of whether it's a highline or a fibrocartilage interface. So then our highline cartilaginous interface is going to be consistent with a synchondrosis. If we use the same colour. And then for our fibrocartilage joints, we then have a symphysis. So remember when we speak about a symphysis, we're going to find them in between the adjacent vertebral vertebrae in the form of the intervertebral disc and we also find symphyses where we have two bones joining each other that are typically going to be load bearing such as in the pelvis where we have the pubic symphysis. So the structural or the functional classification associated with cartilaginous joints are then going to be amphiarthrotic joints so they're going to permit a small degree of movement. The last one then, because I have run out of room on that side of the light board, um, is going to be the synovial joints. So our synovial joints are going to be the most common joints. The interface associated with synovial joints is going to be ligaments. So if I start up here drawing our typical synovial joint. So with the synovial joint specifically, there are six different types or classes of synovial joint that I expect you to know. So I think what is important first is to actually talk about the characteristics associated with all the different types or classes of synovial joints. So for a joint to be classified as synovial, it has to have a fairly unique composition. So firstly, if I, so I'm gonna just change a couple of colors over here. The main material composition associated with a synovial joint is going to be ligaments. So in a typical synovial joint, you're either going to have intra and or extracapsular ligaments actually enclosing a joint space. So a synovial joint always has to have a joint cavity. And in this joint cavity, it is going to have a synovial membrane. It is going to have intra and extracapsular structures. Um, it is also going to have synovial fluid, which is going to function to help cushion, protect, and provide nutrients um, to the joint space. So if we draw out a typical synovial joint, so if we use the colour pink for this, so imagine we're drawing a representation of the knee, for instance. So up the top here, we're going to have the femur, and we know that the femur is going to articulate with the tibia. We know that we will never have bone-on-bone -bone contact because that consistent rubbing of the bone is going to cause further damage. So what we do in fact have on the periphery of the bone, we have a cartilaginous structure which is made up of hyaline cartilage which is going to be our articular cartilage. With any synovial joint, 
We're then going to have a capsule or a joint cavity enclosing it. So if we draw this as change color. So if we draw this as our capsule, on the inner lining of the capsule, we're going to have our synovial membrane. And it is this synovial membrane that is going to be excreting or producing the synovial fluid, which is going to be located or running within that joint space. We're also going to have a series of intra and extra capsular structures. So we know that with the knee, for example, that we're going to have our collateral ligaments, which are helping to secure that joint capsule by anchoring it to the bone. We also have intracapsular ligaments that we know is going to be our cruciate ligaments. We know that in that space too, so a synovial joint is going to consists of an amalgamation of connective tissue as well as cartilage, and then obviously we have bone. So we know that we also have the menisci. And then floating between all of this, we're going to then have our synovial fluid. So that is going to be the typical structure of any synovial joint, regardless of the type or the class. So what I'm going to do now is actually go through the different classes or types of synovial joints that we have learned through the semester, just making sure that you are aware of the common movements associated with each of them, as well as the range of movement associated with the different types or classes of synovial joints. So specifically now I'm going to draw out and provide you with pictures and details associated with each of the different types or classes. Mm -hmm. So the first type of synovial joint is going to be our plane. The plane joint is also known as a gliding joint. Okay, what is important to remember when we're actually classifying these specific classes is that they usually are based on the range of movement associated with each of them. So specifically, when we're talking about the range or the axes of movement, I use the acronym NUM to help remember. Okay, so this is referring to axes. So N is going to stand for non-axial. And this is typically going to be associated with the joints that really do not move much at all. The second one is going to be uniaxial. So uniaxial um, joints are going to provide motion in only one plane or one axis, such as flexion and extension, for example, which we know is always going to be occurring in the sagittal plane. We'll come down to the next one. So B is going to be biaxial. Bi meaning that we have two planes of movement. So for example, a joint can flex and extend in a sagittal plane, but it can also abduct and adduct in a coronal or a frontal plane. And then the last one, M, is going to be multi-axial. So multi-axial is going to permit movement in all three planes or anatomical planes that we have learned, such as the glenohumeral joint or the hip joint. So when we're talking about these specific types of classes, these are actually going to be representative of the shape of a joint. So when we're talking about a plane or a gliding joint, we're talking about when we have two flat surfaces that are essentially rubbing against each other. So they're both going to be flat or they're both going to be rectangular. So our plane joints typically are found in the intercarpal joints. And this is going to be the same as in the intertarsal joints of the foot. Specifically, when we're talking about the axes of movement associated with the plane joint, once again, this is going to be non-axial. Okay, the second type of joint then is going to be our classic hinge joint. So our hinge joint, we're going to find in joints such as the elbow and the knee. 
or even our interphalangeal joints as we flex and extend our fingers. Our hinge joint, because we know that typically the elbow and the knee are going to move in only one direction or one plane, we say that this is going to be a uniaxial joint. The third type of joint then is also going to be a uniaxial joint, and this is going to be our pivot joint. So pivot joints are typically going to be found with our proximal radio ulnar joint, for example. Or when we were talking about the vertebral column, we learned about the atlantoaxial joint. So as you can recall from the atlantoaxial joint, for instance, the only movement that it is going to permit is going to be rotation. And we know that rotation is always going to occur in the transverse plane along the longitudinal axis. So this is also going to be a uniaxial joint. Okay, so we have a couple more then. So the next one then is going to be our condylar joint. So I'll put condylar joint and our saddle joint up at the same time. Okay, so the top one is gonna be condylar and then this one's gonna be our saddle. So both these joints are considered biaxial in terms of they both permit flexion, extension, abduction, and adduction. The main difference is lying in the shape of it. So a condylar joint often is going to have an oval surface. Meanwhile, our saddle joint is going to be more the classic convex versus concave arrangement. So examples of this then is going to be, condylar will be in the arrangement of the metacarpal phalangeal joints. Big word. And then our saddle joints are typically going to be the carpo-metacarpal joints of the thumb. And we say that both of these are then going to be biaxial. Our last one then is going to probably be the funnest one and the one we've learned a lot about, which is going to be our ball and socket joint. So if I put our ball and socket joint over here. So our ball and socket joints are going to permit the highest degree of movement. So we know that the shoulder, for example, we can flex and extend the shoulder. We can also abduct and adduct the shoulder. We can also conduct circumduction or rotation, as well as internal and external rotation. So this is going to cover all three of those anatomical planes that we have learned. So we say that our ball and socket joints are going to be our multi-axial joints. And hip. Okay, so I hope this provides you with a review or an overview associated with the joint classification. So remember when I talk about the functional classification, it is going to be the degree of movement. So we use the acronym SAD. So we have our symarthrotic, amphiarthrotic, and diarthrotic. Our diarthrotic joints are going to be all of our synovial joints. So know that with the synovial joint, when we describe them, we talk about the axes of movement. So if it's non-axial, uniaxial, multi-axial, as well as the shape. So the shape of the joint is typically going to be correlated with the degree of movement. Okay, so I hope that this provides you with an overview associated with the functional versus structural classification associated with specific joints. So just keep in mind with the functional classification, we're talking about the degree of movement. The structural classification is talking about the composition of a particular joint, and the two go hand in hand. So for example, our synovial joints are obviously going to be diarthrotic joints. Um, the material composition is going to be ligament as well as our classic synovial joint structure in terms of the joint capsule and the contributing um, material. Thank you very much for your attention this morning.